Well, this conversation is taking place in the height of summer in 2020. It's been a summer that's received great attention right around the world in Australia. Uh, we've had years of very severe drought. The landscape is unbelievably dry. We've had horrendous fires. It stirred up an enormous and very, very important debate. Now, in terms of Australia's landmass, around 60% is managed by farmers, the rest by indigenous communities, by governments, by national park managers and so forth. Soil happens to be the biggest holder of carbon of all. What we do with our soils can be part of the problem or part of the answer. And in this conversation, we seek to explore these issues. It's being recorded on our family farm in Northwest New South Wales. I'm here with Terry McCosker, who has interacted with a vast number of Australians with his in-course training, if I can put it that way, uh, that's been enthusiastically endorsed by thousands of farmers across Australia, and with my own son and daughter-in-law, Nick and Alex. So I'll come firstly to Terry. Terry, uh, your entity has interacted with extraordinary numbers of farmers and essentially has encouraged them to work with the environment, not against it. But tell us how you got into it and how many farmers you think have attended your courses and have started to rethink the way they deal with agriculture. John, I guess I started, well, I grew up on a farm to start with, so very much uh, understand <coughs> rural Australia. And then uh, I joined Queensland Department of Primary Industries in 1967. So I've been working professionally in agriculture now for well over 50 years. And I guess I <clears throat> got into this pathway, which I'd call a regenerative agriculture pathway, 30 years ago, when I got introduced to a guy called Stan Parsons from, he was a Zimbabwean, uh, but came to us from the, from the US. And I'd been on a cattle property in the Northern Territory and we were running cattle at a beast to 30 acres. And I noticed that and actually measured that within five years, the desirable perennial species were disappearing. And I talked to ecologists and all sorts of people and experts and said, why is this happening? And the answer I got was, that's just normal. That's just what happens. And um, I had trouble accepting that because we're actually losing the most productive plants from our pastures and from our ecosystem. And a few years later, I met Stan Parsons and he had some of the answers for me. And I then traveled around the world in 1991, studying a different form of grazing management. And from that, I understood that there are solutions to that sort of decline in pasture quality. And so that started me down the regenerative agriculture pathway 30 odd years ago. And since then, we've trained uh, over 7,000 people through very intensive training courses and probably another two to 3,000 through short courses over that period. So um, that's a reasonable percentage um, of the Australian agricultural market. Which is probably what, 100,000 Australian farms? Yeah. And on those numbers, really you know, ones. yeah. 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 So you've got around up to, getting up towards 10% of Australian farmers. Yeah, I would say it's somewhere up to that, probably not exceeding that. Yeah, That's quite remarkable. Um, and you're encouraging them, uh, to put it crudely, to work with the environment rather than against it. That's the big shift. Um, and what I've found is that the thing that excites farmers more than anything is to understand they're managing an ecosystem, not a farm. And for 30 years since we've been talking about ecology as the foundation of farming. Farmers have been able to make that shift, graziers and farmers, and understand that it's the basics of their ecosystem. And I look at an ecosystem like a pie, very simple little pie. And at the center of that pie, you've got carbon and you've got ecosystem services, which are free things provided by mother nature. And you've got the water so cycle, so how well water's work working in the ecosystem. Um, you've got soil health, biodiversity, uh, and energy flow, how well we're utilising sunlight energy. But all of those things work together. You can't actually change one without changing the other. And in farming, 
we are changing those things for better or worse. And farming, I believe for the last 8,000 years since farming was invented really, or we started to, to, to farm globally, we've been mining our soils. And agriculture in the, in the modern era has actually been forced to mine soils because consumers are probably not paying the full cost of producing food. So the cost that they're not paying is being met by the ecosystem. But if we work with the ecosystem and we work with Mother Nature, we can improve, if you like, both balance sheets. We can improve our financial balance sheet and improve our ecological balance sheet at the same time. Because the more we work with nature instead of against Mother Nature, the more she helps us, the more water we can store in the soil, the more biology we've got that feeds our plants, the more ecosystem services that we've got that helps produce a crop or produce our plants and our food. Um, and so all that puts more efficiency into agriculture and means that we have to spend less from outside. And so the, the opposite to that is the more we degrade that ecosystem, the more we have to take out of a bottle or a bag and replace it into modern agriculture. And I think we've got to the stage now where some of the inputs that are going into agriculture are so expensive that it's such a very high risk business now to produce many food products. So Nick and Alex, I'll throw it to you jointly. Uh, you're in the business of producing food and the traditional farmer model, and I'm sure uh, it certainly was my way of thinking, was we've got to be focused on our production. We survive by growing crops, by growing wheat, by growing sorghum, oats, barley, whatever it is, and producing fat cattle. That's how we earn an income. And so that's been our focus, production. You've shifted very deliberately to saying, well, actually, everything depends on the soil, the water in it, the carbon in it, the nutrients in it, and what it can grow. That's a big shift. But you are now very tough, tough to the point where you've imposed on yourselves the the really difficult decision to say that for us, the right thing to do was to take the land, the, the cattle off the, the land to preserve the soil and, and the grass structure. That's a big shift in your thinking. For the time being. They're off for the time being. They're coming back. They're coming back. They're coming back, but not yet. Yeah. Um, not until we've got enough soil armor, basically, for them to be coming in and getting that nu nutrient cycling rolling again. Uh, but to go back to what you were asking about our shift, in, our shift in our focus has come off the cows and back to our resource base essentially. But it's built around trying to grow as much. There's, there's three steps in, in a production business. There's three steps. They're basically the resource, the product and the marketing. And the, when we did HM, they taught us that the uh, holistic management, they taught us to focus on the one that you've got the least of or where the weakest link is. And obviously at the moment we're in the middle of this drought, the weakest link is the resource, which is our grass. So that's what we're focusing on. We're doing our very best to grow as much of that as possible uh, for as little money as possible. And the, the more, you know, rather than focusing on our cows, which were actually, to be honest, the problem, we've come back a step and we're focusing on where the, where the hole is, where the dead wood is. Um, and so with that in mind, uh, by removing the cows, for the time being, because we haven't been getting enough rain, we've allowed our soils to maintain a level of cover. It's nowhere near like where I'd want it to be. But with that cover it comes much greater water use efficiency. And with that organic matter in the soil that gets stored there because of that ground cover, ground being plants, we actually get a, a more effective water cycle. So uh, the water that we do get, these small rainfall events that we do get, which have tended to be very heavy, we're actually able to catch them and use them if we have ground cover. If we don't have that, we can't. And if we were focusing on the cows rather than the, the resource base that we have and the ecology of our farm, I think we would have greatly exacerbated our drought. Um, even though we have the same, the same amount of rainfall, the efficacy of it would have just been too low for us to do anything. So now with that in mind, our business is really truly structured around growing grass. It's growing grass first and foremost, and then focusing on the product and how to turn that grass into dollars. And um, and I think we um, I think we're getting better at it. We we um, we've got a lot to learn yet, 
but yeah. We'll come back in a moment to that growing grass because that growing grass is good from an economic point of view as we try to survive as farmers and grow food for people. But there's another point, it's good for the community. If you want to sequester carbon, then we've got to find a, a, a way for further rewarding that and let the community, if you like, share in paying for that benefit. So I'll come back to that one, Terry, with you in a moment. But, but Alex, um, you love animals, it's a very hard decision to let those prized breeding animals and so forth go. Part of this seems to me that you've got to fall in love with your land and your resource even more than you love your cattle and your, your crops. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. And I mean, it was a heartbreaking decision. I know we all felt it was, you know, it was a, not a fun thing to do, but I don't think there's a second that we've regretted it over the last 18 months or so. And it's been a really exciting journey, actually, really looking at our landscape and learning to understand it and, and reading it. And we're far more passionate about growing grass now than we are growing cows. And we use our, we use our, any cattle or livestock we have here as a tool for managing our grass. And that's what they're here for. And if, if they're not doing a positive job in our grass, then they're not here anymore. And so part of that equation for people who are listening to this would be to say, what you're doing is not only preserving the land and such grass as you can, growing what you can, it's having an added benefit. You're preserving more carbon or at the very least losing less than you would be if you were overgrazing and stripping out your land. And you're putting it in a position where it'll absorb more carbon more quickly when it does rain. Yeah. So these are really important things as Australia works out what we can do on this whole thing that people are very concerned about how we manage our climate going forward. But let me ask you another question. Um, uh, some people might say, well, of course you want us to eat meat. You want to produce it. That's how you earn your living. But we don't think we should be eating meat because uh, of, of emissions. And, and that's quite a common story. Now, mind you, 84% of Americans, I don't know what it is in Australia, who say, I'm going to stop eating meat for environmental reasons, give up within 84% within 12 months. They go back to eating meat. We find it very hard to leave alone. But, but you see those animals that you love as part of the solution. You, you wouldn't want to encourage people to think they're going to save the planet by stopping eating meat. No, I think the way we understand how the grasslands work now is that animals are a very vital tool in helping improve those that ecosystem and it's sort of as Terry was explaining before if you just lock an area up mother nature doesn't really work like that it's, it's not a still static system and you need animals and you need disturbance and interaction to really it's it's sort of like when you have a lawn if you just let it go go and go rank and it, it's not healthy and it's not thriving but if you if you care for that lawn and you mow it regularly to a level where you you know you leave significant amount behind and you keep doing that, letting it recover and then taking a little bit off the top. That's the way we manage our grass. So Terry, the, what we're really driving out here as much as anything else is trying to focus attention on the fact that soil is in fact the great retainer of carbon, the great user of carbon, the releaser of carbon and the absorber of carbon. There's a cycle. The, the, the raw numbers on the amount of carbon in the, uh, in the, in the environment that's held by the soil tells you that it, it's the big one. It dwarfs everything else. I don't think that's widely recognised in the, in the very heated debate about climate. So there's two parts to your question, John, I think. One is uh, that, that we're operating in a cycle in agriculture, and I'll come back to that. And then the second is, what are the raw numbers? The raw numbers are essentially that in the atmosphere, there's over 800 gigatons of carbon, and that's carbon, not CO2 in all the vegetation on earth is estimated to be a bit over 610 gigatons of carbon in all that vegetation. In the top metre of soils it's estimated that there's 1580 gigatons of carbon. So if you add up the 800 in the atmosphere and the 600 in, uh, in vegetation, it doesn't equal the amount of carbon that's in the top metre of soils. And that's all the carbon in the atmosphere and, and all the vegetation on earth. Then, the, then we come to the cycle. Just before you do, in terms of global emissions, you know, man-made global emissions as a proportion of that, it's actually quite modest. It's accumulating and people are worried about it. 
but it's dwarfed by what's in the soils. And my point is that the way we manage the soils, well, it can be a massive part of the problem, but we think a massive part of the solution, and we're not focusing on an opportunity here where a lot of good things can happen. You can actually increase the productivity of our land and our food production, improve the quality of the soil, and help with the carbon cycle. That's correct. We can, it's a win-win-win in every direction. To it's put not like carbon burning coal soil. to make a tonne of steel. No. Which so, is linear. So our, um, our emissions are somewhere around 10 to 11 gigatons of CO2 a year. And that's just from um, burning fossil fuels and from cement production. Um, and then we look at the carbon cycle. So you're right, it's not, when we look at agriculture, we can't look at it from a linear perspective. If, if we're looking at taking fossil fuels out of the ground or uh, cement, for example, producing cement, that's a linear approach to carbon emissions. In agriculture, we're dealing with a carbon cycle. Within the carbon cycle, there's 150 gigatons of carbon a year circulating through that atmosphere, vegetation and soil, and it's in and out of those three sources continuously. So we can't look at carbon accounting in agriculture the way we look at carbon accounting in a power station, for example, where we're using a fossil fuel to burn that CO2 goes off the atmosphere. It's not a cycle. But everything we do in agriculture, and soil carbon in particular, is a cycle. So the cycle operates at basically two spots. So we have photosynthesis, which is when everything is growing, all plants, whether it's trees or grasses are growing, Carbon dioxide is taken into the plant and it either produces wood or that carbon is put down into the soil by the plants. When every living thing dies, and that includes you and I and, and insects and animals and trees and grass, and so when, when that dies, that carbon joins up with oxygen again, oxidizes and goes back to the atmosphere as CO2. That's essentially what our carbon cycle is, is that, that movement from uh, going into every living thing through photosynthesis, losing it through oxidation. Now to sequester it in our soils, if we were to retain 10 gigatons a year in our soils and put that away in a 1580 gigaton pool, we would completely eliminate anthropogenic emissions from fossil fuels and from burning of cement. If we were to double that, we would actually be removing CO2 from the atmosphere and starting to lower that, uh, the number of parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere. So soils are actually our solution. Unfortunately, the thing that's got the publicity are the trees. Now there's only so many trees we can grow. And the thing that's probably not understood about trees is once a tree is grown, it doesn't sequester carbon. It is then becomes part of the carbon cycle and whatever it produces essentially goes back to the atmosphere. So it's, it's a stable system. Once you get into a, an older forest, you know, without harvesting or without the fire or whatever in that tree environment, um, the carbon is stable. It's not being sequestered. But in agriculture, we've got a lot of soils globally um, where we can manage for putting carbon into the soil. And it's a massive solution to not just taking CO2 out of the atmosphere. The problem we have with this drought, for example, is a problem with a water cycle. And the water is either in the oceans or in the atmosphere instead of being stored in our environments. So it's not in our soils. So when it's not in our soils, our, our, we're gonna get more drought, we'll get more bare ground, more bare ground attracts more drought. So it, bare ground heats up and sends rain away. And nature is so smart. What she has in living plants is bacteria. Um, Pseudomonas syringii is one of them. And that lives, it's part of its life cycle on a plant. But then it floats off to the atmosphere and it's got a cell structure that allows it to um, create water crystals at a higher temperature than dust particles and pollution particles, etc. So what Mother Nature has created is this system where she makes her own rain. So those bugs float off into the clouds and create what's called bioprecipitation. Then down they come again, get onto the plants that are gonna grow because it's rained. 
and then back they go and seed the next lot of clouds. But when we get a lot of bare ground and, and no water stored, so our soil needs to be like a sponge. And to create that sponge, we've got to get more carbon into the soil. So not only do we solve a lot of the drought issues if we get more carbon into the soil, but we take we start changing the CO2 issue in the environment as well. It's a solution to a lot of things, including, you know, uh, food quality. The more carbon we get in the soil, the better the food quality becomes. So the consumer benefits from that as well. So in essence, Terry, what you're really saying is that agriculture, the production of food, the management of land is a cyclical business. It uses carbon, it absorbs carbon, it emits carbon but quite fine management of that process can produce very, very different outcomes. And if we get it right, you can actually win on climate, you can win on production, you can win on food quality, but it doesn't seem to have had much focus in the whole debate about climate change. No. And a classic example of that, because I've known this for years, and I don't claim to be terribly bright, but a static tree is of no use if you're worried about absorbing carbon. No. A growing bit of grass, which is what you're trying to do here, uh, is soaking up carbon. And you mentioned grass, and this is where the most the, the much maligned livestock come into the picture. Livestock are actually critical to us sequestering carbon in soils because we've got to we've got to allow that grass to grow, be eaten regrow, be eaten, regrow, be eaten. And it's that cycling of the grass itself, which is creating more photosynthesis and extending photosynthesis over a longer period, that's actually taking more CO2 out of the atmosphere. Now, without those livestock there, that grass is like a tree. It just grows. And then if it's not eaten, it will either be burnt or it will just decay or it will be consumed by white ants. But one way or the other, that carbon that's in those plants is going to go back to the atmosphere. So I think this whole methane story in livestock, for example, is completely blown out of the water. It's, it's in a way, it's false accounting. For, for, for example, it is linear accounting in a circular system. <laughs> that methane that goes to the atmosphere has got a half-life of about seven years. The CO2 that goes to the atmosphere has got a half-life of 30 odd years. So even though the methane has a higher greenhouse gas impact in terms of its warming capacity, it's there for much less time. Um, and that methane would actually get to the atmosphere one way or the other. So for example, we take these bushfires or we take a hot fire. A hot fire emits a lot of methane relative to CO2. A cool fire emits a lot of CO2 relative to methane. So if we don't graze grasslands, for example, and we don't manage forests, we're actually stopping the carbon cycle. We're, and Mother Nature does not like things to be static. <clears throat> so she'll clean it up. So you know what we're seeing is a clean up by Mother Nature saying, listen, this is not the way it should be. Uh, we've got to keep this carbon cycling. And this carbon cycle's, cycling's been going for 350, 375 million years. It's one of the greatest inventions ever made. In fact, photosynthesis is so clever that man has never been able to recreate it. So this, the carbon cycle is actually the solution to climate change, not just from a CO2 perspective, but from the fact that it's not raining and the fact that our dams are not filling, our soils are not filling with water and our soils aren't, don't hold water. And our soils will get to a stage, and there's many soils in this state now as a result of this drought and management over the last few hundred years, um, that now won't take water. So the question then is, how do you bake a drought, even if you've got rain, if your soils can't absorb water? And I'd like us later on to to actually do a few little tests just to illustrate. Just to demonstrate. To demonstrate we'll the, the horsepower in that. So Terry, what arises out of this is uh, that if the way in which we manage our land, the 60% that's managed by our farmers and graziers, the 40%, we'll come to that later, that's not managed, but still has to be managed. How do we firstly understand 
what needs to be done. And secondly, work with farmers, because it's going to involve the greater community, we know that, to incentivize best practice. And if you like, frankly, to make it less attractive to engage in the, in the less useful ways of managing land. I'll pay you a compliment. Uh, Charles Massey, the uh, renowned rural writer in this country, thinks that you've influenced more farmers than anybody else in Australia. Um, that's a tremendous thing to have done. Is it your view, because I think this is being missed, that the way Australian farmers think about their resources and their farms has changed significantly in recent times? Yes, I think it is. And uh, I think we're at a tipping point now that when we come out of this drought, um, two things will happen. There'll be significant change in the way people want to manage going forward, and there will be a lot of people leave the industry. The, yeah. the stats on that are scary, how many people want to leave. A lot of people are finding it very tough personally. It's really quite heartbreaking to talk to people who have just have had enough, they're depressed, they have years of negative income. It's been yeah. tough. Yeah. There was a statistic recently published in one of the Australian newspapers and on that saying that over 80% of Australians, their major unprompted concern is the environment and climate change. And when I look at the farming systems, farmers are not being paid the full price of producing food because we're actually mining an ecosystem generally to produce food and still here in terms of, of income. So if consumers don't want to pay the full price of few food, but they actually have a concern about the environment and climate change, and 80% of them do, then they must be willing then to contribute to farmers to help change the climate. And the simple way to do that is through two mechanisms. One is carbon credits, and the other is environmental credits, um, biodiversity credits, um, which is a growing market. So can I just make an observation there? I think one of the, I mean, I'm you know, obviously a former member of parliament and so forth. I am staggered at the fact that the government has actually done a better job here and made more progress than anybody gives credit for. And we'll come to the missing gaps because that's critical. We're not there yet. We've got to accelerate that. But we've made more progress than anyone realises. And in fact, uh, you know, Australia's emission levels per person are coming down quite well and it's largely because of land management. That's great. The point is we can do a heap more. We can do massive amounts more. So if we just encourage 3% of Australian farmers, and this is excluding the rangelands, which is the largest component of that managed land in Australia. If we just looked at the more intensively managed landscapes and managed 3% of that, we could uh, sequester around about 60 to 70 million tonnes of CO2 per hectare per annum. Sorry, not per hectare, per annum in Australia. If we got some encouragement um, through government and the community to increase the rate of adoption of that across the farming community and took that just to 20% of that landscape, um, we could remove well over 200 million tonnes of CO2 per annum, um, put it in soils which will increase um, food security, water security, uh, and food quality, and resilience on farms, um, and and have an impact on both the water cycle and CO2 in the atmosphere. Um, but we need some encouragement to do that. Now, Australia leads the world in terms of soil carbon technology. This is a bit, that's part of what's missing. We don't. No one gets. No one seems to know that. No, people don't know that. But Australia led the world in 2011 when we set up the Carbon Farming Initiative, which was a bipartisan approach to encouraging carbon farming in our farming community. So the legislation is actually in place. <clears throat> there is money in place to buy carbon credits. The downfall is in the restrictive linear nature of the methodologies that we have to work under. So in terms is, is, of is, is that a <clears throat> is that a longhand way of saying it's not farmer friendly? It's definitely a longhand way of saying it's not farmer friendly. It's yeah. bureaucratic, and it's done that for a reason. But I think unless we loosen up the ability of farmers to actually get involved, 
then they're not going to get involved and there's this whole potential to change the climate and and improve particularly rainfall and and take some co2 out of the atmosphere unless we free this up a little bit to allow farmers to do it and i'm not meaning do this in a way where it's not real i mean it's still got to be measured and it's got to be done in a way that the market believes and understands that when they're buying a carbon credit it's real it's in the soil and it's locked away um, but there is so many impediments um, the discounts that farmers for, get for soil carbon um, is phenomenal it's it's if I go and sell my soil carbon from the first time I measure it, after taking 40% that you're not allowing me to sell, you then halve what I'm allowed to sell. So what you're saying to me as a farmer is, um, will you go away and sequester this carbon for us? That'll be really good for all of us, the whole community. Um, but we don't expect you to actually get any return on the investment you're doing in that for a minimum of 10 years. And then within 25 years, we'll stop paying you for it. Um, that's a real disincentive. But we expect you to invest to do it. So you're, you're expected to put money into funding a baseline, for example, then funding another measurement, then funding another measurement, and then doing the changes that you need to make on your property, all of which cost money, and money out of your pocket, but nobody else is funding. And then saying to you, will you just wait for another 10 years, John, before we give you any income? Those are simple things that can change overnight if there was the political will to do it. That could change overnight. And we have 750,000 hectares in our pipeline of carbon projects to do. If some of those impediments were removed... How many? 750,000 hectares of farmers lined up, right. like farming land lined up to wanting to do carbon projects. And this is not trees, no, where we've is, made great progress. This is soil. This is about sand, uh, soil and vegetation management. That's correct. It's by, by that I mean basically grasses. Yeah. But we need to take that up to 7 million hectares, you know, not, not 700,000, um, and, and maybe 70 million hectares. Um, so we've basically got bureaucratic impediments stopping that from happening. There's no reason why, with the right encouragement, the farming community won't go down that track and sequester carbon. As I talk to some scientists, they agree 100%. Um, other scientists say, no, we don't trust farmers in a tight time not to abandon it all and push their country too hard and just re release every good bit of carbon sequestration they've managed to, to uh, carry forward. Uh, all scientists agree that this is a very important area. I haven't met one who doesn't think it's important. They just, I think, depends a bit on how they feel about farmers. And maybe that's reflected in the fact that it's set up in a way that's very difficult to access for farmers. Yes. We like the fuss over drought relief being hard to access, but this one, surely there's a national interest in getting it right quickly. There is. Um, and that, that concern is real. Um, but the way- so the concern, just to pad that out, you've got to be able to work out what the baselines are and what different managements are doing and then record them in ways that are reassuring and reliable for the, the buyer and the seller and are economical. That's, and, and under our current methodology, that's all solved. And it's all solved. Yeah, that, because it's measured. So if you do a baseline and I come back in five years time and measure it, if, if you've added carbon, then you will get paid carbon credits. But if in 10 years time, you've actually not sequestered any carbon, then you won't get paid. And if you lose what you did up here, then you have to pay it back or rebuild it. So that safety mechanism is in the methodology. Um, I don't have a problem with that, um, provided we continue to actually measure it, measure it accurately, but probably do that less frequently than we have to do at the moment. Um, and there are many new technologies that we can use. So the other issue for, from a farmer's perspective is cash flow. So at the moment, the methodology and in landscapes like this, we, we would re-measure that carbon every five years. So that means you go five years before you get any income out of the credits that you've actually sequestered. And then you go another five years before you get any more income from it. If we were uh, able to simplify this thing down to where we were able to use satellites and models and other things like that in between measurements, extend the measurements out to reduce the cost, but then trade annually off what's going in there. And then you, when we do a re-measurement, you get a make up or a make down. 
and you adjust what credits you've actually been paid. You do that. You would do that very conservatively, but at least you would get annual cash flow out of it. And then when you get into seasons like this, this annual cash flow means that farmers don't have to go screaming to the public or the government and say, help us because we're in a drought. Because the cash flow can be there from credits that you've sequestered in the past or that you're going to sequester when the drought breaks. Um, so there's a mechanism there that can actually take a whole lot of pain straight off the public purse when we get into seasons like this. Uh, and it, as I say, it's a solution to so many things. Now, now you, you made the point when we were talking earlier that in fact there are Queensland farmers, Western Queensland farmers, who've been able to do successful trades with timber. Yes. And it's seeing them through the drought. Yes. Because they're being paid for the carbon sequestration with growing trees and preserving their, their forests. Yeah, so there's two schemes in Western Queensland and Western New South Wales. One is called avoided deforestation. Mm -hmm. So that is where people had um, a permit to clear yep. and decided not to. Yep. So if they'd cleared, that timber might have been burnt. So yep. there was a loss yeah. of, of yep. carbon. So it's not absorbing so carbon, but the fact that they're not pulling it down means that that's they're not going to release it. That's correct. It's an avoided emission. Avoided emission, yep. yep. The other is human-induced regeneration. Yep. That means that I'm encouraging trees to regrow on country that either didn't have any or might have been pulled in the past. Uh, and there's both those schemes running at the moment. Uh, I've got clients who are making substantial money out of those carbon sales through this drought when they've got no livestock. Uh, one client who's got 200,000 acres right out in Western Queensland. He's had no rain now for seven or eight years. Um, but he can keep staff, he can maintain his infrastructure uh, because, and he can do development on his property ready for when it does rain because he's got an income from those carbon credits. Now that income only lasts 10 years. So you've got to make the most of it when you do get it. Um, that's a difference between trees and soil. So in soils, under the current rules in Australia, you can get income from sequestering in soil for 25 years. There's a methodology in America where you can actually do that for 40 years. And I think that's much more sensible because soil carbon is so slow to build. Yeah. The other thing that many scientists don't understand and, and most people don't understand is that there is no limit to the amount of carbon we can put in the soil. Absolutely no I've limit. I've heard scientists say that uh, we can only store limited amounts. Yeah. And you're saying there's no limit. There's no limit. Now, the reason is, so when they say that there is limited amounts, they're working on percent carbon. So if, if I look at this soil right here, for example, its limit might be 7% organic carbon. But when the topsoil reaches 7%, Mother Nature will start pushing that carbon down through the profile. And if that profile fills up in the next 100 years, Mother Nature will build soil, well, that'd be taking carbon continuously out of the atmosphere to grow soil. And that's where soil comes from, out of the atmosphere. These trees you can see behind us, that tree did not grow out of the soil. If it did, the soil would have sunk where the tree is. That tree has grown out of the atmosphere. Every living plant we have, 90% of its nutrients are in the atmosphere. Including the carbon. Including carbon. So it's, it's carbon, it's oxygen, it's water. Um, all of those things are in the atmosphere. Nitrogen are all in the atmosphere. 90%. Uh, whether it's a crop or whether it's those trees, 90% of their nutrients are in the atmosphere. Now, Terry, uh, it's important in the context of the bushfires and the row over... Um, reducing hazard, uh, fuel loads and what have you in forests, to remember that two things, around 40% of Australia's land is not managed by farmers, uh, and that traditionally, indigenous people in particular, of course, engaged in cool burns, they were into hazard reduction or into fuel reduction in a big way. And that's been part of the ecosystem in Australia for a very long time. The truth about cool burns is that they probably help you sequester carbon if they're done properly over the cycle. What do we say about the publicly owned lands and what do we say about fuel loads and uh, fuel reduction? The feedback I've been getting for decades from 
primary producers who are up against national parks and so on is that they're not managed. Yeah. Um, from a point of view of fuel load is one, um, feral animals is another, um, native animals is another. So you've got massive roo populations, for example, coming out of those parks and doing real damage to landscape around them. So I think there's a history of those not being managed. Whereas um, they were managed in when absolutely. indigenous communities were running that land. There I was think, a pattern there. Yeah. I think the thing that would surprise most Australians would be to know that if we had had satellite imagery of Australia when Captain Cook sailed up the coast, and we don't have satellite imagery, but we do have photographs from well over 100 years ago, and it indicates that at that era, there were far less trees in Australia than there are today. There are massive areas in Australia now that are wooded, that are woodland, um, that weren't 150 years ago. And there's lots of evidence of that. Um, and massive areas, uh, the Queensland where I'm more familiar, um, areas of mulga now that are mulga, that in the 1920s and 1930s and prior to that were open grassland. The same with a lot of what we now know as Brigalow country in Queensland. Um, that was, a lot of that was actually open grassland with a few Brigalow trees scattered through it. So all of that now is trees. And people are saying now, well, you've got to leave them there because they've always been there. But that's not right. And when you look at the size of the trees, that alone would tell you that they haven't been there for 500 years. Um, so I think we've really got to rethink how we manage forests and national parks. Uh, taking livestock out of national parks, for example, that has the potential to keep it more open, to reduce fuel loads. Um, I don't know why people would think that leaving some livestock and under controlled and managed way within a national park, I don't know why people would think that that's damaging. It's far more damaging not to reduce that fuel load because those hot fires then do significant damage relative to a cool fire. And our ecosystem in Australia has evolved with indigenous burning practices. And the, the indigenous people have got knowledge about burning, which have never passed on. And we need to try and get hold of some of that information before it disappears. And there are a few people around that are starting to teach us how to do that. We, so we need to start bringing that in, not just into our forestry, but our grasslands and everywhere. Um, but if you look at, a lot of people will say, for example, well, well, Australia 200 years ago, 250 years ago, did not have livestock in it. So therefore, how can you argue that livestock are good for the Australian landscape? And that's true. 40,000 years ago, it did have. But there's two ways in which an ecosystem comes into balance. One of those is fire, and Australia had a, was a fire climax ecosystem. But if you look at America, where there were massive herds of bison 300 years ago, or big chunks of Africa, where there were massive herds of game, um, you had a grazing climax. And a grazing climax has a different structure to a fire climax when it comes to grassland. So both of those will actually keep landscape open, more open. So you will have less trees under a grazing landscape, a grazing climax, and you'll have less trees under a fire climax. Now, what we've done in Australia is we've taken European knowledge in agriculture, applied it to an entirely different environment, taken fire out because we don't want to burn because um, several reasons, but mainly because we're losing livestock feed if we burn. But then we haven't managed those livestock in a natural way. So the livestock, in, if you look at the way livestock um, run naturally, they run in very large mobs and continually move. If you look at the way the bison operated uh, or the way herds operate in Africa today. So what we did was start putting up fences and just throw animals in there and let them spread out and stay there for 100 years. And that is damaging. But if we put those animals together now and go back and and emulate what Mother Nature does, put them together in bigger mobs and keep them moving, then that landscape changes. So if we want to run livestock in Australia, 
we need to run, manage it to get a grazing climax. We have neither at the moment. We have neither a fire climax nor a grazing climax because we've taken fire out and in our forests, we've taken it out for too long and the fire load builds. I, I, the fire load's not the only cause of the what's gone on in the last few months. The, the, the fact that we've had a massive drought. Now that massive drought, you can, you can trace a lot of that back to the fact that our water cycle's broken. So we're not getting the rainfall. Um, and I, I know at home, we get a lot of cloud, but we don't get any rain out of it. So something's changed and it's not just CO2. It's the whole, there's a lot, lot, lot of changes. So we've got high winds uh, that have come together with very low humidity, which have come together with high fuel loads, which have come together with very dry conditions. Um, and so you've actually got a, a real problem on your hands. These are really important things to keep in mind as governments now, cabinets everywhere, are going to have to stop and think and we trust, work cooperatively with one another to learn the lessons and act quickly. But a big part of what all four of us are saying, I think, is that the way we manage our land, our soils, our pasture, as well as our trees, the trees has had some coverage, people know a bit about it, they haven't focused on grass, pasture and cropping, as part of the solution because of the role of soils in the carbon cycle. We need urgent attention to this. We need the road box cleared. So let's just then briefly explore if we had the opportunity to get before the decision makers, what would be the key messages? For me, there's two parts to that. One is what is the strategic problems Australia faces at a strategic level and what are the solutions to those problems. I see at a strategic level we have climate, the climate is changing whether it's caused by humans or whatever else, it's, there's no doubt that it's changing. That change in climate is going to have an impact on food security and water security which are significant um, strategic issues for Australians and I'm concerned I have grandchildren who will still be alive in, at the end of this century. And I'm concerned about what our national estate is going to look like at the end of this century if we don't address those three things. The, how do we mitigate that climate change um, and adapt to it rather than, rather than mitigate it? How do we adapt to it? Yes, um, because the truth is globally, Australia simply can't have enormous impact on the mitigation. Not to say we shouldn't do our bit, but we, we have to be hard-nosed about the sheer numbers. We do. Adaptation is going to be critically important, but if we adapt the right way, we can help mitigate and we can export that knowledge. That's correct. Now, to me, if we take those three really strategic things, you, you, you know, adaptation to climate change, food security, water security for this country, um, and, and management of the national estate, really four things, but they're all linked. There's one simple solution to all of those things. And that simple solution is let's get carbon into our agricultural soils and encourage farmers to do it, um, fund them to do it, help them get started. Um, and that will actually start to adapt the climate, both from a CO2 perspective and a water perspective and rainfall perspective. Um, that will help with food security, because if we've got more water stored in soils, more water stored in dams, our water cycle starts to return. Um, we've got more food security, we've got more water security. It's one quite simple solution to all of those major strategic problems. Whose heads need to be knocked together to clean up the fact that a lot of, you've said this, a lot of the policy frameworks in place but it's simply not farmer friendly, not land manager friendly. Yeah, I, I think that governments have actually done a very good job of putting a lot of policy in place. And Australia leads the world in terms of, of some of that policy. It's the nitty gritty and the nuts and bolts around that policy that need to be tidied up and needs to be made um, farmer friendly. And I think there's a few heads that need to be banged um, amongst the, the, the bureaucrats and the scientists who control um, the detail in the methodologies. Uh, and <clears throat> I think we can make them a lot cheaper, a lot more accurate while we make them cheaper. Uh, and 
and not lose, if we do not want to lose the credibility that the Australian system has built into it. Um, and so I think that's possible. But I mean, you've been in the chair in this situation yourself. You'd probably have a much better idea of, of how to bang heads together and how to make something like this happen. So how would you go about it? Well, in our day, when we had a problem that, 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 that involved different agencies and different departments and so forth, it really depended upon the boss and the senior ministers around him getting them around the table and saying, we want this fixed. And if you take something like Salinity or even the National Water Initiative, which was largely undone, unfortunately, by subsequent governments and ministers, it was done by drawing ahead together the relevant ministers and the relevant departmental heads. What are the roadblocks? Where are you being competitive rather than cooperative? We want it to end. We want it done in a seamless, coordinated way. And, and, one and of we way, want it done quickly. We want it done quickly. And I think one of the ways in which we can do that is start looking at whole of farm methodologies. So if I look at you know Nick and, and Alex here, if they wanted to do um, a soil carbon project on this property, then that's one project. If they wanted to conserve these trees or plant more trees, that's a separate project. If you wanted to reduce methane emissions, that's a separate project. If you take nitrogen out of your farming systems, that's a separate project. Whereas what we should be doing is looking at this farm and saying, how can you be rewarded for reducing emissions in every way you can reduce emissions? And how can you be rewarded for sequestering carbon and taking it out of the atmosphere? So there's two things. One is avoid it, and the second is take it out of the atmosphere. Farmers are the only people that can get it out of the atmosphere. Yeah. And we need to because do that not more linear. quickly. To go it back not to linear. the tonne of steel produced by two tonnes of coal, that's linear. Yes. What we do, it's a cycle. It's a cycle. And so if we can get the cycle into a better shape, we can go on making a That's contribution. That's correct. So every time carbon goes through that cycle, all we need to do is be leaving some behind. Yeah. We can't stop it and we don't want to. We actually want to accelerate the cycle so it's easier for us to leave more behind, particularly in the soil. More opportunities and, to catch it then. And, and carbon stored in the soil. So carbon stored at 20 centimetres within a soil is stable for between 1,000 and 3,000 years. So talking about a 25-year permanence period, is rubbish when you start talking about soil carbon that has the ability to be stable for thousands of years. And the deeper you go, the longer that stability goes out. And it goes out to sort of 10 to 13,000 years by the time you get down to a metre and a half. So getting it in and getting it down through the profile is the way to treat permanence. So we've got this permanence rule in there that is actually crueling the ability of farmers to make money out of carbon. And Nick and Alex, you're confident that uh, as long as you get the right policy support, uh, you can go on producing high quality foodstuffs, even in a rapidly changing environment. Yeah, I think so. I mean, it's, it's something that we're currently working on, like helping our ecosystem services and storing carbon, even, even without any policy, because it's something we believe so strongly in and something that you know, we see every time we drive past a living plant or a tree with grass growing under it or, or, or our livestock in the paddock cycling nutrients and, like, we see it and we live it every day and it's, um, it's something we strongly believe in and it's something that we see is really being able to strengthen rural communities and strengthen farm profitability in an industry that's really crippled at the moment and going to help those regional communities that are really, really suffering. And you're not alone. You're finding other young farmers who are thinking along the same ways, they're optimistic. Uh, they believe we can make it work. Uh, it would be handy if we just had the right framework, particularly when it comes to providing incentives, and that means money really, for best practice, and let's be blunt about this, some disincentives for bad practice. I think if, if we were to go back a bit to what you asked Terry about what would you ask the influences what would you say to the influences influences and decision makers it would be that for me it would be that you can't grow a nation on bare soil so if whatever policy you are going to write or or not write it needs to keep in mind the best practices which which keep the soil covered need to be rewarded um and uh, you know yeah i think in terms of 
in terms of seeing optimism within the community, though, there's there is a handful of certainly a handful, if not more, of people our generation who really are starting to look for answers and starting to find them in these processes. And the more we drive around, and as Alex said, the more we drive around and see the ecosystems functioning, ecosystem services functioning in on our place, the more we realise that. It's there really is something to this, and it works. Well, there's a couple of points that need to be made there. Uh, one is that some economists point to something which is interesting, and if you stop thinking about it, quite obvious. If we get this right, and farmers have transparent and trustworthy monitoring services available to them, you don't even need you don't need taxpayers' money. You don't even need Australian money. There'll be people internationally piling in to buy those credits. Well, that's good for everyone, not just farmers. That's good for the broader economy. Australians are plainly looking, Terry, for a compelling and honest and credible narrative around climate change because that's been the focus with the drought, with the bushfires. And indeed, we know that the eyes of the world have been watching us. I believe that the first thing we have to do is establish the raw facts. We have to be honest about certain things. Uh, we can do our bit, but we cannot solve the problem. It's a global problem. Uh, we'll serve no one if we smash our economy because we have to adapt. Part of the answer is actually to diversify and strengthen the economy. But the narrative is plainly not satisfying anyone at the moment. I know you feel strongly the same way. How do you think the narrative should be framed? If I was leading Australia, I would be saying to the people of Australia. Firstly, I understand that 80% of you are concerned about the environment and where we're heading with our national estate. Secondly, we understand at a government level that water security and food security are paramount to the security of Australians. But we have a solution to that. And that solution is that we're going to encourage and pay for, and the community will assist in paying farmers to take carbon dioxide out of the air, put it in soils, which will start to rehydrate landscapes, will remove CO2 from the atmosphere, uh, and will give us food security, water security, and start to address the issues around the environment and climate change. Well, Terry, Alex and Nick, thank you very much for joining me for this conversation. I think we can agree that we're on three things. We're passionate about agriculture and feeding people and looking after the land. Uh, we're passionate about ensuring we pass it on in better condition to future generations. And I think we're passionate about our belief that proper land management can be a big part of the solution to the climate concerns that Australians have. Thank you, John. Thank you. What we're going to do here is a little infiltration test. So we're going to look at how long it takes an inch of water to get into this soil. And we'll have a look at a couple of other sites. So I'm just going to, we're going to pour a bit of water in and I'll start the clock going as soon as it goes in. And away you go, pour it in and we'll start that running. And we'll just let that run and see how long it takes for that water to disappear uh, on bare ground. So generally in the bare ground like this, we're going to get a lot more runoff. So you can actually see here, just in that little bit there, where those rocks have held the water up a little bit. So you've got just a little bit more water retained there than there is back here uh, where that is. In fact, you've got another classic example just here, where you can see the pattern of the flow of water running off this landscape where it's bare, a couple of rocks that have slowed it down, building up a little bit of soil back there. And this is what we call animal impact. See the hoof um, effect there? Now what that, that hoof has done is actually broken up this crust and it's that crust there that stops rainfall going in. So the animal breaking that up, now what will happen is there will be some seed in there. The next lot of rain, the water will infiltrate in there and then we'll get a germination of plants in that spot and then that will start to recover that bit of landscape. What have we got to? 114, 115. Yeah, I can't see that. But, uh... There's actually, you can't, 
I won't touch it, but there's a little grit. That's a one inch line there. So it was pretty much bang on that one inch line. It is dropping down. Yeah, it's going right. So we've got, oh, you won't see it because I've grad, I've marked on this side. So if you come around here, you'll see it. Okay. We've, we've actually got here, well, I've hammered it in an inch and there's a, there's a mark at an inch. Then there's a one inch mark here and a two inch mark here. So we can see we're at two minutes now and we've dropped, oh, maybe halfway. So we're just getting, we're getting close to halfway there now. And this is on bare ground. So I guess it rains. This, well, it's gonna be slightly quicker here, partly because we've, we're sitting right on top of this uh, mm. rainfall block. So the sediment's gonna be fine. If we were to go oh, here, say, away from this finer stuff, it'd be slower again. In my, I would assume. Um, no disagreements? Yeah, I do, yeah, okay. yeah. It's probably him, do you think? Yeah, I think you can done it there. Four minutes and 45 seconds. For one inch. Which actually isn't too bad. That's pretty good, yeah. 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 When you're ready. Okay, so we've started. And again, this is just another infiltration test. So what we've done here, we've put this, this ring over a tussocky perennial. It's only a little one, but there should theoretically, well, there is um, quite a deep root system in there. So those root channels really help the infiltration, really help the moisture get down. We've got the added effect of this, the damming capacity of this. And when we were at the last one, we were talking about that, where we've got that fine sediment buildup where the water's slowed down. And you can see it here, how much more there is here as a result of this, this thicker bit of cover. And so where's the line? So we're already, we're already almost halfway there and we're at 44 seconds. So it's a lot quicker already. Um, the, other thing, the other effect we get from having these plants is we actually get, after the, after the fact of the rain, we get uh, a shading effect which really helps to conserve that moisture. We keep that in and keep it where it should be, where it can actually be productive and grow grass. Um, we've got a little bit of growth here from that last rain event we had four days ago. Um, and it's really interesting, if you go out into bare ground, we're not getting any of this. And that's because of the damming effect that has held this back and the infiltration effect has really got that moisture in where it's actually being productive. That's getting quite close. We're at a minute. 20. Do you want to make the official call? It's not uh, there yet. Yeah, you know, you've got a little bit to go. The other thing that's noticeable is that when you've got plants like that, the raindrops hit those plants and takes the force out of the rain. When a raindrop hits this bare soil, that's what creates these very fine particles. So it's the force of rain hitting that bare ground and that creates that little crust there and that little crust then forms and then the rest of the rain just goes straight off so this is what we're talking about when we talk about the water cycle it's this ability of the landscape to take the water in and hold it like it's a sponge and it's the carbon in there that really um, affects how much it can hold done it's 250 yeah, so 250, so First almost four. twice as fast. Yeah, so that that was what, that was 445, wasn't it? Yeah, 250. And this is, I mean, that's only a little plant. If you stuck it over something big, it'd just be going a lot faster. Yeah. So that means that uh, really management of the landscape for getting the water in uh, is a major, like a a, a drought is caused by water not getting in and being held in that soil. And, and what a lot of people are gonna be doing now is sending these small falls of very precious rain straight off down the hill. Along with um, the precious. Along with precious soil. soil. Um, so it's really, how do we manage this resource so that that doesn't happen and we retain the water in the landscape? And that's what we really mean by getting a good water cycle. And what, what we're trying to do now too on this place is by, with our animal management, is conserve these patches and every time it rains we're trying to make a patch that was this big this big and the next time it rains it's this big and then you know after once we've strung six or seven of those events we end up with a patch that's out here 
and that patch has grown to here, and all of a sudden your bare area is this. Yeah. Not all this. And those will join up. And that's what's, you can actually see it's, it's happening over there. We've got one big bare, one big grassed up section there, and this is starting to come. So it's all a recovery process. And that's about that. One little thing that, that struck me in our discussions today uh, with particularly uh, Alex and Nick, <clears throat> and it's very consistent with people that uh, farming regeneratively is the enthusiasm for what they're doing. It's infectious. Instead of um, being worried and, and having mental health issues as a result of pressure and, uh, and worry and so on, uh, you get excited about small things that you're finding in your landscape. And um, it's actually a very common trait across everybody that's regenerating their landscape. They're part of it and excited by what the changes are. And even when they're small changes, even in a year like this, um, those changes are exciting. Um, the other side of the fence often it's just depression and things disappearing and nothing happening and uh, it's a different kettle of fish. Absolutely. Okay so what we've got here now is a much more optimal situation where we've got this big tussock. I'm actually going to pull a bit of this out so that we can see the soil otherwise we don't get an accurate measure but if you can see in there like that's a good good litter coverage like I really had to pull some back. Okay you ready Alex? Ready? Go. Get out of the sun and done. So stop 11 minutes seconds and 45 milliseconds. So that's what a good perennial deep rooted perennial and some litter will do to your yeah. infiltration rate. And um, the 11, 10 or 11 seconds infiltration rate for an inch is pretty close to optimal. Um, so if you put that in proportion, 10 seconds versus four and a half minutes, um, that's a huge difference in the ability of that soil to take in moisture. Mm. So 10 seconds, well done. Spot I think on. the other thing to remember too is Getting water in the ground in 10 seconds reduces the severity of drought and reduces the severity of floods, increases your profit. Like imagine how hard it is, imagine how much easier it is to make money off this patch of land yeah. compared to this. Like there's potential money there yeah. and there's nothing here. It's also, it's also a fantastic solution to the problem of um, us getting much harder, heavier summer falls and that seems to be the mm. way our rainfall is going and that this yep. is the way we plan on coping. Yeah. It's one of the issues with the change in climate is the intensity of the falls. Yeah. Thank you for watching this episode. We appreciate your support. If you value vital conversations like this one, be sure to subscribe to the channel there and also click the notification bell to stay up to date with new releases.